I've got a convicted murderer with a sawn off shotgun, which was by now just a matter of inches from my face. That was, without a doubt, the closest I got to death during my career. I'm Peter Blexley. I'm a former Scotland Yard detective. This is the story of the most dangerous man I ever found. This is 24 hours in a manhunt. It was March 1985. I was a detective constable working at Kensington Police Station. And I'm getting ready to tidy my desk, think about getting home, when I hear a colleague taking a phone call. And it sounded very interesting. This colleague was talking to the police in Scotland. They were telling him how they were hunting their most wanted man, a man by the name of James Alexander Bagri. Bagri had been convicted of murder after killing someone with a shotgun whilst he carried out a robbery. He'd been sentenced to life imprisonment in a maximum security jail, but miraculously had managed to escape. And so they searched the house of Bagri's best friend and they found nothing of any interest apart from one scrap of paper which had a London telephone number on it. It was this telephone number that they were passing on to my colleague. I spoke to my colleague and said, so what are you gonna do with this information? He said, I'm gonna contact the landlord and see if he knows all his tenants and see if we can find out if one of them might be Bagri. I said, whatever you do, do not do that. Because if Bagri is one of his tenants and is on the run and has befriended the landlord, you could be tipping him the wink. What we'll do is we'll keep very quiet about this. We'll put a team together and first thing tomorrow morning, we'll kick that flat's door in and we'll see if Bagri is there. Me and one of the sergeants will book out guns. We'll be first through the door and if Bagri is there, we'll put the handcuffs on. At the crack of dawn the following day, I was back at Kensington Police Station, spoke nicely to the station sergeant, and he booked me out a gun, a Smith & Wesson revolver, and 12 rounds of ammunition, six to go in the revolver, and six spares in case we got involved in a bit of a shootout, which I really didn't want to happen. I was first through the flat, kicked it off its hinges, ran in, Gun at the ready. In the flat, there were two single beds. One of them had a young man fast asleep in it. The other bed was empty. At gunpoint, I instructed the young man, keeping his hands where I could see them, to slowly get out of bed. I spoke to this young man and he said, oh, my flatmate is a lovely guy, but he sometimes goes out as a drink might pull a woman, and so often he doesn't come home. There's nothing unusual in that, he just, just didn't come home last night. I wasn't convinced this young man was telling me the truth. As I poked my nose around this flat, I found a photograph, and I said to the young man, is this your flat, mate? And he said, yeah, that's him. I had a picture of Bagri taken from when he was arrested, and I compared it with this photograph that I'd found and it was very difficult by looking at the two of them to definitively say this was a photograph of Bagri. So what I did was I slipped it into my jacket pocket and my intention was to take that photograph to Heathrow Airport, put it on an aeroplane, fly it up to Scotland so Scottish police could say whether or not this was definitely Bagri. Yes, this was back in an analogue world. Policing was a lot different back in 1985. Eventually, we left the flat with the young man in it. We made our way outside, and my colleagues gathered together to discuss the important business of the day, breakfast. I'd heard at some point that Bagri might have been working as a builder. So, 
being the curious detective that I am, I was looking up and down Phil Beach Gardens. Lo and behold, I saw a van. I had a little look in through the front cabin and I could see that behind the driver and the passenger door, it was sectioned off from the rest of the van. And there was a glass window between the front cab and the rear part of this transit. I made my way round to the back of the van and there were two windows in the doors. I peered through them. I couldn't really see very much at all. And once again, being nosy, being curious, I stuck my hand on the back door handle. The door opened and literally just started to clamber in to the back of the van. When all of a sudden, a head popped up from beneath a blanket and I put my hand into my jacket to start reaching for my gun that was in the shoulder holster. Three quarters of myself is in the van and I instantaneously blurted out, good morning. I had a lot of leg pulling over that, that I actually said good morning to him. And then immediately followed up with, I'm an armed police officer. As I'm fumbling for my gun, Bakery reached to his side and very quickly pulled up a double barreled up and over sawn off shotgun, which was by now just a matter of inches from my face. He'd beaten me on this quick on the draw competition. I wasn't going to fumble around for my gun anymore. I ran like the wind, shouting to my colleagues who were still discussing where to go for breakfast. He's got a f gun as I legged it away in the direction of the front of the van. I didn't want him to shoot me in the back. Had my gun out, took cover, laying on the ground, but positioning myself so I could see through the glass partition between the front of the van and the back of the van where I'd found Bakery. I could see him moving around. Do I take a shot from here? and try and take him out. Bullets in those days had the irritating habit of sometimes bouncing off windscreens. I also had to think that a bullet has got to go through a second piece of glass. It's got to go through the glass partition and then it's got to hit Bayery to be effective. No, nah. that was a complete non-starter. So I wasn't going to start firing wildly in the hope of hitting him. What I did was I shouted at the very top of my voice. You are surrounded by armed police. That was a lie, by the way. My colleague, who'd had the other gun when we'd searched the flat, had already scarpered. He disappeared off for his egg and bacon. So I was the only cop there with a gun. I also told him in a very, very loud voice, to put his weapon down and slowly come out of the back of the van with his hands above his head. He didn't do either of those things. And then, after a few minutes, he closed the door, the door which I'd left open when I legged it. I was quite happy about that. I thought, OK, maybe he's going to stay put for a while. But Earl's Court was just coming to life by now. People were coming out of their flats and their homes and going to work. I've got a convicted murderer with a sawn off shotgun in the back of a van. I've only got my pistol and people are walking down Phil Beach Gardens. This is a nightmare scenario. My colleagues, of course, had got on the radio to ask for help, but I needed armed help and a lot of it. And the specialist firearms branch were based at Old Street in East London, and I'm in West London. They weren't going to be arriving for some considerable time. I kept shouting, you're surrounded by armed police. Put your weapon down. My greatest fear that he was going to come out with his sawn off shotgun and take a hostage. Will I be able to get a shot at him from this position? Should I change my position? Should I go so that I've got the back of the van covered? but that would have involved a severe risk to me 
of being seen by Bagri and potentially shot at, or having him come out of the van with his shotgun blazing and me not being in a position to take him out. I decided to stay put, to keep an eye on the van and keep my gun trained on it. There I am, lying prone on the ground with my gun trained on this transit van and to my horror, a woman who was clearly going to work starts walking towards me. I would think she'd make a perfect target for Bakery to jump out and take hostage. I tuck myself in as much as I can, kind of hiding myself behind the car because I don't want her to see me. I'm hoping that she's going to walk past me so that she is now not between me and Bagri. She gets a few yards from me, sees me, this bloke in jeans and a bomber jacket, lying on the ground with a gun in his hand, and she freezes. She stands still like a statue. This is a nightmare scenario. I said to her, I'm a police officer. Keep walking, keep walking. She's transfixed. She's not moving. I leveled my gun at her and in a very impolite manner, told her to move. She did, unfortunately, ran straight past me and in essence, to safety. After what seemed like an eternity, the firearms branch turned up together with their long old rifles that they had in those days berets that they wore. We did, of course, now have a siege situation. A headquarters was set up nearby. Specialist hostage negotiators turned up. And very fortunately, I was able to get off the ground, put my gun into the holster and go back to Kensington Police Station, where the first thing I did was ring my mum. And so, about 24 hours or so after I'd first heard that phone call to my colleague from Scotland, the siege of Phil Beach Gardens was now in the hands of the experts. The hostage negotiators provided Bagri with what they call a field phone, like a very early type mobile phone. Apparently, he got increasingly depressed and demoralised didn't drink anything, didn't eat anything, and made it clear to the hostage negotiators that he didn't want to go back to prison. In an effort to try and save Bagri from himself, armed officers fired CS gas canisters through the back windows of the van. Their intention was to try and incapacitate Bagri so they could drag him out of there alive. And after the CS gas has been fired through the windows. If you listen carefully, you can hear a muffled bang. That noise was Bagri putting his shotgun to his head and killing himself. I wrote up my report, my statement about what had happened that day. Colleagues went back into the flat and arrested the young man who'd clearly lied to us that morning. The landlord got a visit because, of course, what had happened? My colleague had contacted the landlord. He had told him about Bagri. So, of course, what had he done that night? He'd gone and told him that the police were looking for him, which is why Bagri had gone out that night, had a few pints, got in the back of his van, was going to sleep the beer off and disappear first thing the following morning. But, of course, I had disturbed his sleep. I wasn't very happy with my colleague. I told him not to go and see the landlord. And by going against what I'd asked him to do, he very nearly got me shot dead. Sometime after life in Phil Beach Gardens had got back to normal, there was a coroner's inquest into Bagri's suicide. The coroner eventually ruled that Bagri had indeed taken his own life, and he made some very complimentary comments 
about me and about how the Met had handled that siege throughout. The coroner said, DC Blexley did not act precipitously. In other words, I didn't start letting off bullets left, right and centre, but that I'd acted in the best traditions of the Metropolitan Police. That day, the London Evening Paper had a banner headline across its front page. Suicide siege, police right. I wonder what the Metropolitan Police would give to get headlines like that these days. I was sad that Bagri took his own life, that he was able to take the easy option rather than serving his life imprisonment sentence. I was, of course, incredibly glad that there is not now a police memorial stone in Phil Beach Gardens to Detective Constable Peter Blexley. That was, without a doubt, the closest I got to death during my career. I remain very, very grateful for the training that the firearms branch gave me all those years ago. Because I was on autopilot when I said, I'm an armed police officer. That's what you're trained to do, to identify yourself with a gun when you've got a gun. And it undoubtedly was that training and that one line to Bagri that I am convinced made him stay in that van.